Hey, today's lesson and objective is on understanding the traditional hard drive. A traditional hard drive is sealed air tight. Um, any microscopic particles, dust that gets in to a drive moving at these speeds cause, causes catastrophic damage. So they're sealed air tight. You can see in this illustration, they've got multiple discs and platters inside the container uh, that we move around so uh, uneloquently uh, and in this one, you can see there's four discs. In this one, there are microscopic clearances on these, uh, which is why it's important to treat them nicely. And they move at extremely high speeds. And we're going to talk about some of those speeds uh, today. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that your data could be anywhere on a traditional hard drive. Uh, it's scattered all over the place, and we're going to talk about how to unscatter it. But in general, most people's drives are, are pretty um, fragmented, or the data is all over the drive. Uh, how do they work? So basically, in a traditional hard drive, we've got multiple platters stacked up, like you saw those four in that illustration, spinning together in unison at extremely high rates. In fact, the lowest speed drives anymore are 5,400 revolutions per minute, whereas the highest drives get up to 15 and 20,000 revolutions per minute. All those disks have independent read-write heads on them that move together in unison across the disk together uh, by an actuator and an actuary or arm. And each side of those disks can be read on the top and the bottom of the disk. So when we look at a drive with four disks, we know that there are eight heads, one on each side, that can read and write data to a traditional hard drive. So uh, also, each of those is divided up into sectors or sections, and we'll take a look at an illustration uh, there. And when it writes to a drive, it tries to write to the outermost section first because there's the most data on or most data locations on the outside of the disk so that it can access it more quickly. So it tries to write from the outside in, and we'll take a look at a couple illustrations uh, on that in particular. So here's a, a good picture of a hard drive in general. Let me go full screen. There we go. There's a good picture of a hard drive in general. Uh, the spindle is the part that uh, the disk itself spins around. Each one of these has is a magnetic platter on the top and the bottom. This is the actuator in the actuator arm here that moves across the disk. And each one of these little tiny ends there has a magnetic head for the top and the bottom of each one of those disks on a traditional hard drive. Now that disk itself is broken down into tons of little pieces. Think of them as like folders in a file cabinet. And those pieces are called sectors that they're broken into. And each spot on the drive as you go in and out is a different track. And each track is broken down into sectors where data can be saved and stored. This picture has red all over it showing that, that this is what the actual data is on this illustration right now. And it's a good illustration to show that uh, all the information isn't together. In other words, when you go to open a large program, it doesn't just go to one spot and read the whole thing. It actually goes to a file table that tells it where on all the disks and all the platters and all the sectors all your data is. And it could be all over your drive. In fact, we're gonna take a look at one drive, mine, that uh, I started to defragment in class the other day. Hopefully I didn't get it all the way and we can show you how uh, spread out data can get on a traditional hard drive. But it's important to understand that it's written down in little pieces all over the place on your hard drive. Now, I wanna take a, a look at a quick video for you that um, really does a good job of showing you how a hard drive uh, moves about rather quickly and you get a kind of an idea of how fast that thing moves back and forth across the drive to gather data. And it's doing it on the top and the bottom of all those disks at the same time. So it may not be reading from the one we can see. It may be actually reading from one on the bottom of that one. We don't know as we're looking at it where exactly this drive is reading from. It's just all those actuator arms always move together. So maybe it's looking for this track and a sector in this track because it's spitting by it. Um, 
three discs down. And it's important to get a kind of an idea that as we get uh, smaller and smaller drives, and we know we've got three and a halfs and two and a halfs, that can have the exact same amount of data. They can both be one terabyte. So as we get smaller, those clearances also become smaller and more microscopic. So that's one of the reasons I really have said in class that a, a traditional hard drive and a laptop is a catastrophe. And uh, most laptops anymore are sol sold with solid states. But if you have a laptop that doesn't have a solid state, I really recommend you move to that. And we'll talk about that more when we get to solid states and the difference uh, in uh, G tolerances and how much we can move them between the two kind of drives. But these microscopic clearances are why a traditional hard drive uh, becomes... Uh, problematic when we look at them in uh, the scope of such a small area that's being moved all the time. So we've got positive and negatives of um, traditional hard drives. We've already looked at costs, so we know that traditional hard drives are the lowest cost per gigabyte or per, per terabyte. If we're looking for large amounts of storage at low cost, there is no alternative other than a traditional hard drive. Uh, at low cost. Now we do know and we've looked at how solid states have gotten larger and larger, but they're also still five times more expensive uh, in general uh, and more per gigabyte and per terabyte than a traditional hard drive. I'm going to talk about how long they last in warranties. Uh, warranties on traditional hard drives and um, longevity are, are expressed in two ways. Uh, one is mean time before failure. How many hours they say in a lab this drive could go before it fails. And I stress in a lab. Doesn't mean it's going to last a million hours for you or 1.5 million hours. Many of them are rated sometimes 2 million hours. That's over 100 years. In fact, I think a million hours works to 117 years. We know that's completely unrealistic in uh, a normal practice because they fail because of vibration. They fail because of heat and they fail because things fail. Um, but that's one of the ways that they're rated. The other way they're rated is annualized failure rate or AFR, which is a percentage of how many drives are returned to them in any given year uh, that have failed. AFRs are a more accurate way of saying, how good is this drive? Uh, so I tend to like AFRs. But in general, uh, as far as holding data, a traditional hard drive left at rest will decay far slower than a solid state drive. So if you're looking to hold data longer, it's probably better to store it on a traditional hard drive than it is to store it on a solid state drive because solid state data over extended periods of time can decay and you can lose that data. Um, as far as data transfer rates, I said plus or minus. So if you're Comparing a SATA drive, this is a um, traditional SSD on a, or a traditional hard drive on a SATA drive. You're comparing that to a um, SATA solid state. The transfer rates are the same. Both of these connect with a SATA cable. Both of them cannot do more than 600 megabits um, per second. However, this can't get to the data as fast as this can get to the data. So um, once it's found, this one can transfer basically the same speed. However, if we're looking at M.2 drives, uh, let me hold that in front of the whiteboard. Uh, if you're looking at M.2 drives, we know they're far faster in transfer time. So I have a plus minus there. Uh, traditional hard drives have slower response times. We're going to talk a little bit about response time here in a second. Uh, they are susceptible to damage. In other words, movement. If I'm using this traditional hard drive in my laptop versus this solid state, uh, this one can take far less G-forces movement uh, than this one can take. And then the last thing is data fragmentation. We're going to look at fragmentation a little bit. That is a big thing with a traditional hard drive that you do not get uh, in a solid state drive. So there's, there's a couple positives. There's a couple negatives of that. When I said response time, there is a time it takes to find data. This is relatively instantaneous, a solid state drive, whereas on a traditional hard drive, it's got all those disks, platters, sectors, tracks of data. 
that it has to find the data before it can give it to you. And that speed that it finds that is called the response time. And that's a factor of two things, of the latency and the seek time. The latency is how long it takes before the data to get underneath that head. So it's calculated at half the disk rotational speed, which means that the faster the disk turns, the lower the latency. Makes sense. If it's going around at 5,400 revolutions per minute versus 10,000 revolutions per minute, the latency is going to be roughly half on that faster drive, which is why we like faster traditional hard drives. Some downsides to that, they use more energy, and because they're going faster, they're also more susceptible to uh, damage, which is why when we get into the super fast drives, they're usually only for servers, server environment, put in a closet in a, on a rack that's made to uh, absorb some of that vibration, and in closets that are cooled to a temperature that no damage will happen to the hard drive. Uh, the other part of response time is the seek time, which is the time it takes uh, the head to travel halfway across the disk. So uh, it's, we're assuming that it's halfway away from that drive. So both those things are added together to say what the response time is of this drive. Now, I'm not saying there's a huge times, but when you add them together, especially when a disk is fragmented and data is all over the place, um, versus zero, relatively, uh, that response time can make up a difference, which is why we like to see those faster drives. So uh, that's what response time is. The next thing is data fragmentation, or where's the data? Is it all together so that the, the seeker head goes like and then reads all the data? Or is it all over the place and the seeker's going crazy trying to find it? Uh, in general, Unless you have a good defragmentation plan, your stuff is all over the place. Windows doesn't intend to do that, or the operating system doesn't intend to save it like that. But what happens over time is, we've talked about in the memory section, how the hard drive is used as a swap file for memory. And as information goes back and forth from the hard drive, at the same time that it's writing data back and forth from the hard drive, it has to put it somewhere and it puts it in the next available spot when it's writing which may not be anywhere close to the first available spot let's open up two different fragmentation programs first of all we're going to look at the windows fragmentation program which by the way i think is a terrible fragmentation program so if i just go down to my windows down at the bottom and type defrag i will get the Windows app to defragment hard drives. And I'm going to look at my G drive here. It says it's 2% fragmented. And if I analyze it using the Windows tool, it's going to go and analyze it and tell me again how fragmented is it and what do I think is, is it okay? Well, it says it's, after analyzing it, 2% fragmented. That doesn't sound so bad. 2% of my data uh, is stretched all over the place. That's what Windows says. Now I'm going to open up a program called Defraggler, and I'm going to let you know that I have already used this in class as of this recording. Defraggler does a little different job. I'm going to go ahead and go to that G drive again. I'm going to analyze it and see what Defraggler says and how many fragments, and I've already defragmented half the drive as of this recording. It says it's 53% fragmented. Holy moly, that's a big difference. And that's why I don't trust the Windows defragmentation program. Now, when I'm done, I could go ahead and defragment. And what that is going to do is it's going to go to every single file on my drive, read them, and write them together into a contiguous or continual file. I'm going to go ahead and stop that so I can show you um, one or two files before it gets too far. Um, so it will take all my data when I defragment it and put it all together or contiguously or in a row in order so that when I go to read a, a piece of information off this traditional hard drive, it goes to one track and the track goes around underneath it and it reads all the sectors in a row, making it much faster at retrieving my data. Let's go ahead and use the file list here on the defragler to just take a look at it and uh, let's look at the size of this file. And like I said, I've already defragmented a bunch of them. This six gigabyte file is broken into 24 different fragments in those locations on my hard drive. And as Defragler runs, it's going to put all 24 of those together. 
lowering the lag time that I'm getting while I'm reading and writing data. So a defragmentation program and a continual use of it can greatly increase my response time and my read time on my traditional hard drive. And I told you in class, or maybe I'm telling you now, about uh, when I was a programmer for Dayton Power and Light. I programmed a system called the Time of Use Billing System that another intern would then use to print out bills based on the time that you used power. And he would print about 100 bills a day. And he called us about a month into the program uh, in the middle of July and said, hey, I start printing checks or bills uh, when I come in between 8 and 9 o'clock and they're not done when I come in the next day. And we were like, what? And we went in and looked at his hard drive after doing all kinds of troubleshooting besides that. And when we defragmented the drive, it was crazy fragmented because he was getting data every 15 minutes on all of the test subjects power usage and all of their data was completely fragmented all over the drive. Defrag took about two hours to run, but after that, they were down to taking 30 minutes to do all the bills. And we started a process that every Friday when he left work, he would start defragmenting that drive so that when he came in Monday, it was fully defragmented. So fragmentation is an issue that does not exist in a solid state drive that can be a big issue on a traditional hard drive. So that's fragmentation. And that's the end of this section uh, on traditional hard drives. You can go and take the quiz right now before moving on to the next section.